of the League of Legends Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Sam, a.k.a. Just Casual. Here I have with me Blake, a.k.a. Wise Papa Smurf. Yeah, you do. I'm fucking <laughs> depressed right now. We just lost so much good banter. <laughs> it'll, it'll be like, I don't know, maybe we'll really, I don't know what to do about that, but we'll figure it out. I mean, and we can't we got... release anything because Alex turned up, our Alex turned oh, up his right. mic and he didn't oh, yeah, sign. Mike. So it's not like we can use the video for like deaf kids. Also, my uh, my audio was bad too, apparently, for the stream. So, yeah. I but don't then know. again, Hopefully deaf kids know. is probably a pretty untapped market for podcasting. <laughs> Lip readers. <laughs> what would you do? Like, do you have like you put really heavy bass into it so it like hits their ears a so, certain so way? <laughs> so it reads like braille. I don't yeah. know how you would do that. <laughs> We just Do send it in out like code a, where it taps. Yeah, we just send out like a one of those like accounting strip things out of a calculator that's just got the little braille pads. I on mean, it. or you know, lip reading with the vods. Oh yeah, I guess they can do that. Yeah, I think that kind of makes sense. <laughs> isn't it like a video and not a podcast? Isn't it like a vodcast? I don't know. Everyone in the <laughs> esports scene or the gaming scene, they do vodcasts and they call them podcasts and kind of makes me upset when there's no audio version of it. Cause I do, we, to uh, it. do we do closed captioning? Uh, we, we should maybe do YouTube's auto-generated closed captioning, which gets really funky when you use like technical jar- jargon about League of Legends or whatever. But I don't use technical jargon as much as like expletives. You know? Uh-huh. And I'm pretty sure closed captioning knows what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Probably not. I'm going to put my finger on that it would not do well with Blake. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, our third member that we have here, Alec, a.k.a. Wormlax. What's up? You've I'm heard here. his voice. Um, so, talking. yeah, we had a lot of uh, talk that is lost that was talking about kind of our placement matches and how tilting they can be. So I just wanted to give a little PSA before we start this episode about that kind of stuff. Placement matches, yes, they're kind of stressful, but... Ultimately, they don't really matter, so don't get stressed about them. Even if you go 0 and 10, you'll make up for that. Once you start playing, what, like 50 games, 100 games, whatever, you'll get to where you've been as long as you're good enough. So don't get tilted in placement matches. I'm sorry they suck. Uh, That's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. The single two worst times to play League of Legends are your placements and the end of the season. Those are the two worst times. And the worst is that one follows the other one. (laughs) So, I mean, it is what it is. You just get it done and out of the way, and you go from there. I mean, shit, I went like four and six, and I got seeded into plat two. Perfectly fine. I didn't think it was going to be that high, considering I won like 40% win rate. That is really high. But, you know, okay. I, I, you know, I roll with it. Right, and I'm I'm pretty much thrilled. Oh man, I mean, I'm thrilled with that result. That's great. But like, I'll tell you who wasn't thrilled with their result. Everybody who rage quit in my fucking placements. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were not doing too hot. I had three rage quits in my ten games of placements. Like Holy that's cow. nuts. And two maybe of them were ADCs. Do what? Maybe they felt. Maybe that's why you got placed so high. They like felt bad. They're like, man, this guy had three people rage quit. <laughs> yeah, they're like, congratulations <laughs> for finishing the game. You must be flat <laughs> too in mental fortitude. <laughs> wow, you actually still have this game installed on your PC. Yeah. We're really happy about that. Like, here's a little placement luck for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised uh, it's not funny. like you're the X factor and three people leaving your game. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Take this Maybe. brief mental health survey to stop being an asshole to your friends. Like, what? Is that like when uh, there was the stories of Netflix sending like the police to people's house who had watched like consecutive episodes of Netflix like? days in a row and they're like are we sure this person's okay are they still stable like do they need help do they That's really need that? that there that has actually happened there was some guy who was watching for like oh, i forget how long it is but you know they have that like check like hey are you still watching and he mm-hmm. kept you know clicking it so he's at least like there so they, they yeah they sent uh the police over and the guy was like i'm fine I just work from home and I'm watching a lot of Netflix all the time. 
I would sue the balls out of Netflix for sending law enforcement to my house for using their service. Well, I mean, if I, I was watching, like, Suicide out. Wives or something, that's a show I made up, by <laughs> Suicide the way. Wives. You know, if I watched, like, a marathon of, like, Suicide Wives, like, 400 times, then I would be like, okay, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe that guy's season. mental health is questionable because he's watching cannibalistic baby murder, like, all day, then that would be oh, one thing, God. but... But just like you've watched Netflix for an inexorbitant amount of time seems kind of kind of much. That's too funny. But uh, Ice Norbs actually has a question for us. Oh, shoot. What happens if you dodge in placements? Uh, it doesn't count as a loss. You'll still have to play the game, but it really throws you back in terms of it. Okay. The, Riot never released the formula on what happens. <laughs> But it does, it's not like a promotional where it counts as an auto loss, but you will play 11 games, and that will count as a loss in your series. Yeah. It's, it's weird. I, I, it, it will not say, like, let's say you, you're on game 10, right? Like, this is your 10th game, and you, you know, dodge or whatever, right? In riot's algorithm of whatever they will count that as a loss but you will then play an 11th game for your 10th game yeah it's basically like a hit to your mmr it's an mmr then, hit yeah because you'll end up like probably placing lower because that loss does like take an effect when they're thinking about placing you but i would say if it's only i would like if you're really having a toxic like lobby i would say go for it in, in well, at least one game if like you're really feeling like don't dodge like two to three games but if you're having one lobby where you're like wow everyone's fighting like people are taking tp on jungle and stuff like that because they're mad like it's not a bad idea to dodge one game i have a hard time believing it's as bad as a real loss but like i remember when they yeah. first introduced the system they had said don't dodge in your placements because it kind of fucks you on your formula yeah just don't dodge. And uh, by the way, I found the article, a different article I was thinking about too. There was a, actually the cop sent to someone's house in Ireland for League of Legends for suicidal comments while playing League of Legends. And see, I could see that though. That's like your suicide yeah. wives thing. You yeah. Know? <laughs> but if yeah, I, yeah like... the cops come because an Irish gaming company apparently got contacted by Riot that like to like send the cops to this guy's house it's really weird but the cops were like received a message from an irish gaming company tell us you have suicidal tendencies and slash you are suicidal <laughs> yeah that'd be uh quite the talk to just, have show up at your house instead riot should just start ddosing the other team something <laughs> give him a little like morale lp boost like no that'll, that'll fix it up fix you up good but anyways we are here to talk about patch 8.2, especially the questions that you guys have brought along in our Facebook group. Make sure you're uh, in there so you can just like get your questions and stuff asked onto the podcast. So patch 8.2, big patch. Um, a lot of things happen. Uh, first thing, first question we have is from Greg L. And he says, goodbye, safe bot lane. So what happened in the bot lane and safe bot lane gone, actually gone? So I'm kind of lost in what he's trying to. What he's trying to say is there's no more double relic shield horse shit where you just ah. can't kill anybody <laughs> ever. As a bot yes. laner, I know exactly what he's talking about. And yeah, amen. Glad yeah, it's done. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I'm happy it's gone. It kind of <clears> fucks <throat> me as Thresh, though. I was about to bring that up. It really is unfortunate that the way to nerf ADC is taking... Uh, Relic Shield has now screwed Thresh over because I honestly I don't know the exact numbers, but I'd say with that nerf, it's probably more worth it to take Ancient, right? Nice. Yeah, Ancient Coin would be the item for Thresh now. What was the nerf? Do you guys remember? Yeah, if you're ranged, it's half effectiveness on the heal. Yep. So they're just trying to say, if you're an ADC, don't fucking buy this because it's not good on you anymore. The heal doesn't do nearly as much. 
And, you know, that's for 90 percent of all support champs that's fine except thrush is ranged yep. yeah it's a weird weird thing for thrush mm. pretty unfortunate and i'm sure they'll compensate it somehow well, they said they were going to give him some <laughs> kind of a buff and i'm like well where is it <laughs> okay i mean that was a really good item for... i used to that's the other thing is i used to build face of the mountain on thrush religiously so yeah. in this patch, not only did I lose actual face of the mountain active, but I also lost the ability to actually heal people with the passive in lane. So it was like a real kind of a double whammy for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. I really don't like the change of not having those actives for the yeah. uh, support items. I, I honestly big loss. I, okay, so let's talk about that a little bit, because I don't think we ever really did. Or at least sure. I didn't listen to the episode if we did talk about it. No, this is 8.2. Okay, so here's why I hate that. And that's, well, I guess the next question is, why did they ruin my first back side stone? So, in other words, let's answer that guy's question. Yeah, that's right. Well, actually, okay, before we go on to that, another thing I want to say, are AD carries going to take fleet of footwork still? Cause that's that's all yeah, they were taking I, fleet of fleet uh, footwork. They're taking over overheal. Is that the other one? Yeah. Other rune. Mm -hmm. um, they're taking a lot of defensive things. Even going resolve as a secondary. Is that gonna still happen? I think fleet footwork is still worth it on a lot of eighty carries that need that sustain in lane. Like I think a vein, a gin, like sivir. I think hyper carries. That, yeah, like people like Kogma, People who will use it and like that's still really useful for like team fighting. Like getting those extra movement speed and life steal, like a burst like that in a team fight, is always useful. Mm -hmm. But I think we'll see like other carries go back to the um, pre precision. What's the precision one? Uh, press the attack. Press the attack. Press the attack. There it is. Yeah, press the attack. It's like press the attack, lethal tempo, and fleet footwork. Yeah, yeah I think we'll see people go back to uh, press the attack because that's still a really strong. Rune. It was just mm -hmm. overshadowed by fleet footwork with Relic Shield with Overheal for a little bit. And with <laughs> all that, seeing a nerf, like, press the attack, will come back, and hopefully we'll see more aggressive bot lanes. Like, all right, that's cool. personally what I like to watch. Cool, yeah. cool. All right, so back to Michael H.'s question uh, about okay. the whole Sightstone support item stuff. Okay, so here's the joke on this deal. They, I hate this change. Like, I've played with it now for a little while. I feel pretty confident in saying this. Uh, and keep in mind, I'm actually, like, the guy that likes to build damage and free up my money for building damage for fun if I'm ahead enough to justify it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that being said, what they were trying to do here is to say, okay, you can just spend the 500 gold on your second tier support item, and then you can build boots, and that's 800. That's the same that you would have spent on your sidestone. And so now you have boots and a second tier support item with no real drawback. And once you get the quest done, you just have a sidestone. You have three charges, which is the same thing as the old sidestone. Mm -hmm. And there you go. 800 freed up gold, right? And then yeah. at some point later in the game... You can upgrade your support item to be a true, like, red-style sidestone, you know, where you have four charges and more health on your support item and blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the reason I don't like this change is, one, by the time you upgrade to full-value support item, that they make back that 800 bucks on the sidestone. Like, the cost is recouped there. Because you're paying a ton of money for what is essentially an inefficient item later to get the extra sidestone, which or the extra sidestone charge, which realistically you kind of need. Because at that point in the game, you're going to need to be able to like put down three wards and then move one if something happens. So you need to have that four ward threshold, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not super valuable to finish, so you hold off on finishing it, and you're able to save a ton of money, so you can build more damage early, so why would I hate that, right? 
Wait, are you saying that uh, the, it, the remnant items are more expensive than... No. Than well, okay. What I'm saying is you're spending another 800 gold to combine it into a better item, right? It's 550. Yeah, but it's usually 550 plus a ruby crystal for, I thought, most of the... Yep, yep, yep. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So that's 950. Or it's 650 okay. usually. It's 650 plus a, a ruby crystal for most of them. Isn't it? It's, uh, it's 550 for the remnant of the watchers, 250 for the yellow one, 650 for the... Yeah, oh. there it is. Face of the Mountain one. That's the one I was talking about. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, you're spending another 1,000 gold to cap it out, which is, I mean, your break even is still less, but it's still, like, you don't get a lot out of that 1,000 gold. Like, the stat-wise, stat -wise, you don't get yeah, much gold out of it. Yeah, or item efficiency-wise, yeah. So, gotcha. like, basically, you kind of sit, for a long time on that item, but I, I honestly don't care about that. What I care about is the loss of agency. And by that, I mean, let's say that we absolutely butt stomp bot lane, right? And we're up two double kills, so it's like 4-0, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's the only way I lose that lane? Get ganked. Get ganked. So what do I want to buy as a support no matter what? Needlessly large rod. Yeah, side stone right away. <laughs> Oh, oh, right, man. I'm going to buy that side stone. I'm going to buy it right away. I'm going to invest that 800 gold to make sure that we don't get fucked on, you know, someone else influencing and interfering with our lane. And then we can continue to smash. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. And I need it. And I need it now. Now, my other option is, let's say I get my double kill and we go back. I'm going to have to buy my second tier support item and let's say boots or something. And then I have to wait until I complete a quest. The earliest you're going to complete that quest is several minutes later. And then I have to go back before it turns into a side stone. Yeah. So that's like two more backs minimum before I can have like good vision control and coverage. And I have to rely on trinkets that whole time, which leaves an enormous window to get butt smashed if your ADC isn't on top of their warding and you're not on top of your trinket cooldown, right? And I lose the ability to choose to spend the money to make that not happen. Yeah. It's the same reason I don't like building the magic boots on most of my supports, so like taking that rune for the boots, is because I can't choose to build the boots if I need them earlier. I'm stuck yeah. to waiting on them. I really, yeah, I really agree with that. I tried taking, like, the boots rune at one point and was like, oh, crap, I wanted to buy Mobies on this back so I could do some roaming, and now I can't. And it's like, taking those choices away, like, it seems good in theory that, oh, you're giving slots to them, but because of the way they did it, like, it's just, like you said, you don't get to choose when you're buying things, so... The game is dictating your playstyle for you, so you don't get to dictate the playstyle, which is like part of the fun of League of Legends. You get to play how you want to play. Mm -hmm. I so. mean, it's boots is one, and then the sidestone is another, and then I also despise the fact that I've lost my activatable things. Yeah. You know, I really hate that, and I don't know how they couldn't manage well I actually know exactly how they couldn't manage to preserve it because you can't put a sidestone active and then another active on the same item yep so okay. I get it you know but at the same time like I don't enjoy that trade off and I thought those items were good to begin with and I've yeah. never felt like oh god as a support I just have to buy a sidestone woe is me you know, like, I remember when I had to spend my entire bankroll on green wards. <laughs> Pink wards. <laughs> and the, no, no, just the green ones. Mm -hmm. Remember? Like, you'd have fucking stacks of that shit, and you'd just run around dropping them everywhere. Because and, there wasn't and don't you remember... You couldn't get a sixth item because you needed, like, three pink wards in your inventory at all times if it got to that, too? Which was painful. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I remember that. Like, that was terrible. We've come a long way. But I don't feel like I need to be a carry. Like, I don't feel like I need six-item damage power spike to be impactful. That's the whole point of support, is you're impactful with utility, not with raw damage. Sure. You but know. then you can still get that extra utility. You can get that locket earlier. You can get the uh, redemption. You can get art and sense or whatever. You can get that earlier because you're spending less money on stuff. Well, what... I mean, really, what this... Sure, you can. And, yes, that that enhances your power spikes. It gives a lot more power to supports. It lets me hit early denial points. Mm -hmm. Right? And I don't know that that's real good. Okay, so, so I don't know I that support items should take over that early in the game. Because if you have a locket early... That can totally sway a team fight sure, when sure. it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. You know, like that kind of shield early on, even at base values, is high for a whole team. You I know, think it's I, fine. if everyone if everyone can do it, then that's I I'm okay with it. I well, mean, I'm just so, saying it like accelerates the power spike, and then it also gives a lot of preference to preference. That's a weird. <laughs> anyway, gives a whole lot of preference to like champions that can get away with building damage early you know like yeah. i can't imagine vilkaz is in a bad spot right now i haven't played him because i've got a mastery seven but he seems like he'd be awesome because you just no, build you know your second tier support item and then go like haunting guys why not yeah you know and it's any mage support i'm more scared of any mage support than the 80 carry like pre yeah, eight. I mean, and you should at this point because now they've got vision and the ability to blow you up. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. it, the thing is, it really kind of hurts like hard engage supports. And I think the whole change kind of pushes things towards a meta where it's like a bunch of boom boom sticks. And I don't really feel that that's super gr I don't want two mid laners in a game. I like the role of support and it doesn't have to be like weaker mid laner with a mm -hmm. sidestone, you know, or weaker vision mid laner or you know what I mean cuz that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. And then we also get into the meta like that playing ADC is just a hellhole because every <laughs> single game you have three to four people on one team that can blow you up. Now the support is coming out of the bush full comboing you. <laughs> like, yeah. it's one thing to have a mid laner that's always after you. Now the support can do the same. Like, Well, you know what the joke of that is? Is that the reason that this didn't work and wasn't explosive in 8-1 is because everybody was countering it with the stupid fucking overheal. ADC yeah. overheal horse shit that doesn't exist anymore. Now that that crap doesn't exist anymore like <laughs> well, it's, it's weaker i wouldn't say it doesn't exist no but... no nobody's buying it for that end it doesn't exist well no yeah. no you mean a relic shield but overheal fleet of footwork and all that stuff it's still it, that's still there so just the sustain got nerfed but it's still usable that, that's that's what i'm getting at okay but, um, i mean yeah sure but the sustain got nerfed means it's not really ideal at all nobody's going that like the reason you go niche shit like that because it's broken you don't that's not your average that's not your default unless it's broken i mean are, are hyper carries not being played anymore in 8.2 i think they still are i mean everybody plays hyper carries but that's i mean before they weren't i haven't seen many mfs and I've been seeing a lot more Trist. I've, saw a, lot of, I've cool. saw a lot of Trist and a lot of MF, but Trist is deceptive anyway. It's not like she's super weak early. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. So one one thing I wanted to say about the whole Sidestone thing, um, I actually like the change. And one of the things I think is okay is that even if you get super fed early, you don't need a full Sidestone to make sure you are completely covered. And I also think that I don't like the idea of actually having complete coverage either. Because as a jungler, then it gets super, super boring when everyone can cover all their spots and then 
suddenly you just can't do anything and you're just farming. And that, that doesn't feel good as a jungler. And if you coordinate with your bot laner, your AD carry and the support, and you have trinkets and you have the, for just that one charge for your support item, you should be able to cover, cover gank routes unless a jungler gets creative or they know where you're warding. I think that's, I think that's okay. You yeah, know? no, I mean, here's counterpoint, if I mm -hmm. can. Um, if you had to take sidestone to keep your advantage, right, that gives mm -hmm. a point where the other side can come back because the 2v2 matchup is super volatile in terms of sure. if you step out of line, you can get smoked, right? Mm -hmm. If you're free to just build damage after the first 500 gold and it's the same net effect, you have less of an ability to mount a comeback because you have two people that are stronger than you in boom boom ability versus before, you know, the sidestone just ensures that you stay in a 2v2. It doesn't necessarily ensure that you win the 2v2. Sure. Right? Because you're just yeah. getting more health. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of... You still had an opportunity if they got up on you in vision. They're still not up on you in, like, combat other than they got, like, a pittance of health. Right? Yeah. So you could come back even in a 2v2 scenario, now it's more snowball-y, which, I mean, it's a meta shift. I don't get mad at these things. I just don't, I don't love the direction that it's going because it's like, it felt to me like this is Riot throwing support a bone and saying like, see, it's okay to build damage. Well, it's like, well, if I needed to build damage, I'd build damage, sidestone be damned. You know, and I don't really yeah, sure. give a shit. Like, you don't need to tell me that's okay. I will judge based on the situation whether that's okay, and I'll fucking do it. And if somebody wants to bitch at me about it, well, okay. Uh, duly noted, overruled, yeah. and we, you know, I'm doing I, I think uh, I think a big thing that Riot's trying to do is try to bring popularity to the support role. Um, I played Phil for my, yeah, every time I played Phil, I got support this season so far, which I was actually surprised because I think at the end of the last season I would get other stuff, but every single time I went Phil, I got support. And I think everyone knows that the support role is the least least popular role too. It'd be cool if I guess it would be cool if it got more popular. I don't, I don't know. Um, but it helped matchmaking. I mean, to be totally honest, it, it's never going to be. Like, it's just not. And, I mean, I'm not trying to say that to be like, I'm a support mate. I'm better than everybody else. I'm a These freaking like martyr it. for my team. No, it's not. It's just it's a frustrating role with less carry potential than the average role, and everybody wants to do damage, and everybody wants to climb, and they want to be in control of their climb. As mm -hmm. a support main, you're not. You influence your climb. You can't. The, there's very few situations much more difficult for you to just throw a game on your back than it is sure, if yeah. you get fed as a mid laner or something. Yep. Yeah. Right. So it's never going to be as popular just on that basis. It's just not, you know, so, I mean, I, I get that they're trying to make it less painful and you know what? Great. I, I get that. But like, I felt like your ability to choose boots or sidestone or damage was an opportunity to express skill, mm -hmm. right? And and recognize what you needed. And now I feel like to just arbitrarily say like, okay, you can buy this item and then you'll get vision, but it's on a timer and you got to do something else first is yeah. like annoying. Cause it's like, okay, well I get it that I'm going to get it for free, but I'm going to have to wait. And it's the same thing with those fucking boots. If I want boots, I want to buy <laughs> fucking boots now. Like, just let me buy the fucking boots if I'm going to buy boots. Yeah. You know, and I think they could fix that boot shit by being like, you know, they give like 150 or 100 whatever gold discount on when you upgrade the shitty little weird sock looking uh -huh. boots you buy. Right? <laughs> so yeah, if I yeah. want to upgrade my brown socks, I get a discount. I feel like they should give you that discount on just regular boots if you want to buy them, like, let's say after five minutes. Yeah. You know, so on your back, you can buy boots, but boots will only cost you 150 gold instead of 300. 
and now it doesn't feel awful to take that that perk or even just give me like 50 bucks off or something or 100 off you know so it's not full value but you can choose to take a bit of a loss if you need boots right now you know sure cool um, one thing I do want to say, I might have misunderstood you, Blake, but I was doing some fact checking about the stats on the uh, the new remnant items. Mm -hmm. It looks like they cost the total recipe is the same cost, even when you once you include the ruby crystal. So it's actually to complete the whole thing, it's the same cost, same stat stat efficiency, and actually the quest gold value got reduced. Hmm. That's the only thing. Uh, okay. One, one thing I will say about those like items, it feels like kind of like when they added all the timers above the scoreboard for jungle camps. It's like one of those things that's right. It's like, oh, you don't know like exactly how to optimize. Let us like neatly shove it together for you, so you know like buy this no matter what as a support. Where it was like jungle camps was seeming, it was like, oh, you can't like, you don't know like timing and stuff like that. It's okay. We're timing camps for you. We're timing dragon for you. I like those changes. <laughs> I I personally, I'm not a huge fan. Like, I think it takes away a little bit from the game. I think like I can understand why. You know it's what? Okay, but part of me is like, that's a skill set. That's part of getting uh, better. At the okay. Game. I agree with you that that is a skill set, and that is part of getting better at the game, but I also agree that taking away that, at least in context of Dragon and Baron, sets you up for more dramatic solo queue at lower levels. Because then yeah. people realize that that's an objective they need to mobilize for, versus most Dragons and Barons back in the day used to just be free grabs if you were there on time. Yeah, right? I will I And will so give... those, like, those opportunities for great team fight drama seem to be there more so instead of expressing skill as i was at dragon when it popped hooray it's now like you express skill that i won a team fight in dragon i chose to disengage from dragon or kill it anyway instead of engaging the enemy or you know what i mean like yeah and yeah, to me definitely... that's that's like the skill i want to see if somebody's climbing yeah, you know that I mean? one I definitely agree with. Like, the Baron and Dragons, like, I will give that because, you, like, having those fights is a lot better for a game overall. But the one I, I'm not sure I would agree with is, like, the red and blue buffs. Like, that having, like, timers and, like, having the, um, like, the yellow thing come up, like, oh, this buff is spawning soon. Like, I think that stuff is a little much. I think that's a little leaning towards helping out players who aren't willing to do the work that, like, really isn't that hard like i don't know to me i after you play the game for a while you start to like you don't even have to like even like on the dot time it. a lot of the times it's kind of just like you have a feel for when it starts mm. to come back up each time oh it's 12 minutes so let's go right yeah exactly so dragon and baron i will definitely agree on that opinion that it does help push the game along and like get these good team fights but some of the other some of that other changes it's like Okay, I understand you want to, like, help out players, but at the same time, like, I like having certain, like, things that are, like, if you do it a little bit better than the next person, like, it gives you that little edge. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I agree on the red and blue buff in particular. I think they shouldn't have done that, but whatever, they did it, that's fine. It's kind of like the support items. Is I'm, I'll adjust to it. It's a whatever they did it, it's fine because it's not coming back. So if that's the case, then all my bitching and moaning doesn't amount to anything <laughs> and better to adjust than it is to whine, right? I do so, hope they include the the ghosts into a different item or add a new item because I do I miss really that love activator. That. I really love that. And it, it made so many, like, weird support picks kind of work. Like, I missed it on Viger. Like, I used to be able to put out the ghost and be able to guarantee I can get you at least inside the cage. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Right? Or yeah. I would do it on Anivia, and it would make it real damn hard to dodge an ice ball. Or I'd do it on Morgana, and I could guarantee an ultimate that led into a CC chain that yep, was yep. probably going to fuck you. You know, 
like a lot of scenarios that those were really good. And like like Thresh, it was really, really useful for Thresh to be given a one time use shield in a fight yeah. because your lantern doesn't do shit for yeah. shielding. Say, Here I'll protect you from one eighth of an auto attack. Hurrah <laughs> You know. Like it doesn't do anything. You're just moving them. You know, yeah, but you yeah. always had that, but it's cool to be able to move them and put a meaningful shield, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But cool. I don't know. I, I, I'm i curious to see how they're going to fix that. But, you know, at the same time, yeah, I really, I don't, I don't love the changes, but it's not breaking my heart either. Because, yeah, I can build early damage, and yeah, I can play Boom Boom Champions. And I think my major, and this is, Full disclosure mode. Uh, the reason I think I am upset is because I've already mastery sevened out all my boom boom champions. <laughs> so I haven't been playing any of them with early money, you know, oh, cash wait, stacks. Blake, did you get mastery seven on Pantheon support boom boom champion? Well, that's hold on. That's boom boom AD though. <laughs> you, you don't really get that. It does. Pantheon didn't really change much. Well, actually, speaking of Pantheon, we have a question from Terry D about the single spell minion aggro changes. So that changes up a ton of lane matchups. Some of them probably not super severely, but some of them very severely. For example, Cassidin. Um, What do you guys think about this change and what should we be looking out for? Uh, well, I think the two biggest ones that come to mind are Pantheon and Cassiopeia. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Pantheon, his Q will now make him take minion aggro. And for Cassiopeia, her E will make her Tim minion aggro. And I think, I also think I'm not sure how I feel about this change. Because on one hand, like, I'm happy to see anything that nurses Pantheon in any way, because I hate <laughs> playing against Pantheon. As odd as that is, that's such a, I just, I, that champion just, I can't handle. But, um, so that's nice that that'll make it harder for him to trade in lane. But, like, Cassiopeia, that is kind of odd. I think it makes sense because Cassiopeia, like, someone like her can, oh, wow, she's bullying me at level 1 and level 2, and then she's also going to outscale me because of the way her uh, champion works into the late game. Like, she's a huge DPS mage that can throw out spells constantly late game, and she's bullying me under my tower at level 3. Like, okay. that that power shift kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, times. okay, here's here's my thing on this. I think that you're 100% right that it didn't make sense that you had the ability to do those things without punishment, right? Mm -hmm. However, those champions were undeniably balanced. Yeah. Like, I've never been like, Cassiopeia is totally out of control. Pantheon is totally out of control. Like, they're balanced. They fit good. This is a nerf, and so you're going to have to give them something back to compensate for the fact that you've just nerfed them, which yeah, I don't... Yeah. I would rather just leave things the way they are because it feels like you're just fixing a non-problem that is a logic problem, but it isn't a gameplay problem. Right? Like, All logically, right, so why can they do that to me without the minions aggroing them? That seems dumb. Fixing it opens up a Pandora's box of balance issues. So what are you going to do? Give all these champions a little bit more armor to reduce the minion damage they're taking? Or maybe give them a little bit like more hit points to be able to take damage where they didn't used to have to? And then if you do that, the net effect is the same. You know, the And thing, then they're the better in situations where they're not in a minion wave. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I like this just because um, one thing that Riot has done is they made they um, a lot of the older champions, some of them are just really easy, like especially like the 450 champions, they're just easy to play. Then at the same time, it's like, oh, but because they're so simple and straightforward, they aren't super viable sometimes. sometimes. There's some exceptions to this, obviously, like Malzahar and stuff like that. And I think because riots and moving f forward in this direction suddenly champions that are e that have point and click spells that are easy to hit where it doesn't really require much skill compared to like uh skill shot champions like ezreal suddenly i think they can balance it a little better to make them more more valuable 
and actually buff them so they can be seen in competitive play or in just higher right. plays because they balance around. You have an easy, easy skill to hit now, but there is more of a mental mind game or a, diff, a more nuance to it than just clicking. Now you have to decide, should I actually click on them? Well, sure, but I mean, okay, so they were already balanced, though, and they were easy. You need easy champions that are balanced in the game. Like, you need that. And so well, you're what you're doing is adding a skill ceiling to it that's on an already balanced champ that is intentionally low skill ceiling. I think right? you raise the ceiling. You, that's you what keep I'm the saying. floor the like, same, but you raise the ceiling so they can be played in higher elos. Just like just they like can for be example, in higher elo, any bot. I know, I know. There there's some exa know, exceptions. Riku to it, Mask and... plays the dick out of Garen. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. these are all champions that are like fucking not mechanically hard at all. And yet, still hit that. They can hit higher play, but regardless, but it's a rare occurrence, though. Well, well sure, I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but then Cassiopeia doesn't fit the mold on anything you're saying either, because you have to hit a skill shot with her before you spam E. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to hit a poison. Yeah. So, no, no, I, I get that. You know that doesn't. She's well, not I, properly rewarded. I can't say that this is true for what the list of like 85 or oh, like 100 I, I mean, champions. I'm, I'm not saying it has to be perfect. I'm just saying like it feels like they've just opened a box. And it's not, they're going to have to do a whole mm. bunch of microbalances to fix it. And if you microbalance a champion to have like more hit points or more armor innately, like base armor, base hit points, or HP5 or something like that, mm -hmm. then you're just making them better in situations where minion damage wasn't a thing. Right, yeah, and then okay. you know, because like just... I'm also thinking about like you've got Jace like in top lane when you go against melees, you can do that thing where you sit on the other side of their melee wave, their minion wave, and just bully them level one, and he's auto attacking. He ends up like taking minion aggro sometimes, and you still because of the way his champion works, you can still do that. Mm -hmm. So like if there's like champions like Cassiopeia and. Other, like they might, they're probably still going to be able to do this. It might just be a little less like advantage than it was before. So I guess like when you put it that way about like these champions, like even though I personally like have a dislike for Pantheon for some reason, can't wrap my head around beating him. I totally understand that viably he is in a place that like he's not a problem. And I think part of the problem is Riot. Like I feel like they have this idea that. Every single champion needs to be competitively viable. In my mind, it's okay for champions to be not competitive. Like, you can, every champion right now, you could play to a point that you get to, like, a higher rank if you play them correctly. Like, every champion has, like, their mains in Diamond and Challenger for almost every champion, if they want to be. But mm -hmm. that doesn't always mean that they have to go to the competitive scene. And I feel like sometimes champions get buffed because, oh my gosh, we haven't seen them competitive scene. Like, we have to do this. And it's well, like okay, let me, let me just, like, one more from there, right? This was done to try to normalize. You know what I mean? Like, this is done to normalize those champions. To say, hey, you're, you have an on-hit effect. It's targetable, so it's like an auto-attack. So we're going to normalize it to where minions aggro you, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you just normalize it to where all spells aggro minions? Mm. I, I would like mess up laning face so bad. <laughs> well, I mean, it's what you're doing yeah, anyway. Like, you're just doing yeah, the diet I, version of the same thing. Well, because it's an easy, easy, quote unquote, easier spells to hit. Well, actually, no, not quote. Unquote. It is easier spells to hit because it's point and click. Yeah, yeah but right, I mean, what's the logic for fixing it? Because it doesn't make sense that you should be able to get damage in without incurring some kind of back that's true of damage in minions in general whether you're doing it with a spell or you're doing it with an auto attack you're doing it with a point and click ability well, you, well the thing is you matter. can dodge skill shots you can't yeah. dodge point and click spells unless you go out of range which may be zoning you off of minion ways cs xp whatever but you can at least dodge skill shots Sure. Yeah, the trade-off there is you're using mana, and they have the potential to dodge that skill shot. You're and using you have the mana for Pantheon it. cues. Yeah, right. And I have, I'm not, you know, I've beaten Pantheons in lane. I have not lost a Pantheon ever since, but I still, you know. And they also, to compensate this, they buffed Pantheon's passives, so the K 
cannon minion doesn't take his passive anymore, like that block. Like it used to be if a cannon minion auto pantheon, it would take away that block. And I would actually like I used to play around this as a Renekton player in top lane. I'd be like, all right, I need him to auto attack me so my cannon like auto attacks him and takes the block for me so I can stun him. That's mm-hmm. not a thing anymore. So they gave him like I don't know, like, I really don't think that's impactful enough to be a buff, and Pantheon is still, like, a champion that will crutch early and fall off really hard late game, so I I don't know, I just, it's not a huge change, but it, yeah, it seems like a logic change that's just unnecessary. Sure. Well, like I said, it just feels to me like you're fixing not a problem. Yeah. And creating a bunch of problems, but not really. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. I will say that it was broke for a very few champions, and they could have fixed just that. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. But I, I think this, could, yeah, we'll see what happens. I don't know. It's kind of weird. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, because we are running out of time, is I just want to talk um, <clears throat> Unsealed Spellbook. If you guys have, have been watching competitive play, like we saw, like I think, seven Unsealed Spellbooks as like the primary keystone for. Uh, like rules, you saw bot lane, both AD carry and support taking unsealed spell book, and they would take TP, and they would actually it's like five man gank top lane, which is really funny, and like finally karma's come to bite top laners in the butt and stuff like that. So I want to I want to talk about that unsealed spell book because I've been using it, and it's been really fun, and I think it's been really really good, and I think everyone should at least consider it when they're doing their masteries for their champions. Okay, you guys play with it? Yeah, I've got I got a. Uh, opinion and i don't know <laughs> to me you go on sealed spell book and look it's awesome and in competitive play and things like that like clearly it's awesome everybody's running it so like highest skill potential there and that's great but the benefit of unsealed spell book scales with your ability to play the game and mm-hmm. your ability to maximize on advantages so mm-hmm. as you get like closer to challenger the benefit of that spell increases exponentially as you get closer to bronze five the benefit of that spell drops exponentially right because you're not maximizing the value of it right like there are times when it's better to tp to lane and then forego having a combat summoner for the next several minutes while you're waiting for tp to come off cooldown there are times at which it's better to absolutely not do that for any reason because you're going to be pressing a fight in the next couple of minutes and you need mm-hmm. that you know but to be able to <coughs> both identify and predict when those things are appropriate on any player that's not super well versed or doesn't have the map awareness Mm -hmm. because it's just like the argument okay remember whenever we were saying if you're in bronze don't take tp to top lane take like not smite not smite (laughs) can't breathe got something in my throat anyway take ignite or take exhaust or take a combat summoner because you'll do better than you will just getting back to lane faster Mm because that's what you end up using it for in bronze you don't tp gank you don't put pressure on minion waves and then teleport to baron or teleport to dragon it just doesn't happen and if that's the case yeah you're not getting anything out of teleport right and Mm -hmm. one of the things that defines good pro players versus not so good pro players is their ability to use TP in the clutch. Yeah. Like that's a very difficult to master skill. Mm-hmm. Now throw that skill and then throw an unsealed spell book on top of that skill. So not only do you have to know when to teleport, you got to know when to change to teleport so you can predict when in the next couple of minutes you won't need to be fighting a fight, but will be needing to teleport. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had, an example of this in my last couple games, I've taken it before where I play like support thresh and I take it for the cooldown of my summoner spells and I feel like I did nothing with it. Like I switched to TP and just kind of like randomly TP it around the map at times. And it was like nice to have the cooldown on my flash. But then this last rank game I played, I had a Twitch AD carry who also took some unsealed spell book. 
he's like, all right, we're going ham early game to like use these summer spells with the cooldown. And we went all in, and we got a kill at level three. He he had heal, I had ignite, so I went in and ignited the vein, and we won the fight. And then we go back. I switch to exhaust. He switches to ignite. Next fight, switches ahead because we had a kill. I exhaust the vein, and he runs up, and he also ignites the vein. <laughs> we have this huge combat efficiency against this vein, and she just died really fast. And it was like, and then. We went back, and it's like, all right, now, Twitch, I'm taking TP, and I'm going to start moving around the map as Thresh. And, like, we won't talk about how poorly I played that game, <laughs> but the thought process was there, you know? we were, we, Me and my ADC were talking about the way we were using the summoners, and we were using it efficiently. We were using it basically off of cooldown, which really helps tools since you have that really low cooldown from the spell. Mm -hmm. Look, mm -hmm. So it's like... That kind of talk, like, if you're doing that with, like, you can practice it, too, if you do it with, like, a duo partner. That helps a lot. But if you're not doing that kind of stuff, it's really, can, you can be wasting a lot of the potential. Of yeah. That's mastery. I mean, there's there's really strong keystones out there. If you don't have press the attack as an AD carry, that's a big loss. If you don't have fleet of footwork, if you don't have um, summon airy or whatever else, like, th you're losing out on a lot of stuff. Aftershock for a lot of engaged supports is a big, big deal. But if you can Glacial use it, Glacial Augment on Tom Kinch is huge. Oh, is it? That's oh my god, it's disgusting. Too, oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. okay, that makes sense. So you can actually, like, stun them and swallow them. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Like, so They like... cannot get away from you. It's stupid. You used to have to wait for uh, exhaust, and now you just auto-attack, like, lick, so they're slow, run up and auto-attack them, they're still slow, auto-attack a third time, Either wait for your tongue to come off cooldown or just eat their ass and walk backwards. <laughs> that it's, ass. It's so dumb and strong. Yeah, but I yeah. mean, if you take Unsealed Spellbook, okay. Yeah, you I lose mean, that. You, you lose it. Yeah. So, I, like, I don't know. I think, it's, I think it's good in the highest echelons of play. I think it's good in coordinated teams that have the ability to coordinate their summoner spells. Like, that's good. However, in like your average solo queue game in your Olympic elos, then maybe not yeah. so good. Maybe you'd be so, better off with a consistent keystone than you would with something that you may not be wringing all the value out of. I think I think you can bring a lot of cheese to it, and I actually think I think you're undervaluing it a little bit. I think it can be used well in lower elos. For example, I am a horrible top winner. Top lane is probably my worst role. What I did was I had a Renekton game. First one, I fed really, really hard. But the second one, I took on Sealed Spellbook. And what I did was I took Ignite first, knowing that I'm going to go all in at level 3. And then I'm going to go back, switch to TP when I can. And then that way I can, like, buffer myself so I can go aggressive when my TP is up. Not get the kill, but just, like, go aggressive and then TP back in the lane because they don't have their TP. Like, right. if you have some force, I think this is a good spell if you think you're actually knowledgeable about the game and you have some pr premonition of, like, what you want to do in a plan. I think it really, really helps band-aid your idiot teammates because you want to go ignite, right, in top lane if you're at a low elo because you probably won't be able to teleport gank that well. But then because you have the option of, like, going back to base and looking at the map and realizing, like, I'm probably going to need TP because Baron's going to be up in two minutes and blah, blah, blah is happening. It's actually really, really strong. And then I, I switched to Ignite because their uh, Kog'Maw or so, some hyper carry oh, was I, fed. Again, you're you're just reinforcing exactly what I'm saying, which is that the skill ceiling is very, very high on that. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and it is. like Because <clears throat> it's the same skill ceiling that's present in using Teleport at all. Yeah. And then plus one... For I have to decide when I want teleport or when I want a combat summoner. But but and the that's... great thing about it, the great thing about it is that because it's so low, I think you can actually use it as that stupid crutch that we say like not to use it as to like band aid your bad laning or mistake that you made because you can get teleport. It's only three minutes or it's I think it's three minute cooldown with until the spell book or something like that. And then you can keep switching things and going back to Ignite and TP just to get back into your lane and do some cool stuff or just like just to get back into a team fight and not have some crazy TP ganks. I think it's actually like it can be really valuable and just makes it it's all it's almost like this like noob trap maybe where yeah, you can abuse something. 
But I think it really is abusable. I think a counterpoint to that is, like, when you're talking about with the Renekton, like, taking Ignite and then going back and grabbing TP, I think you'd be surprised how much damage you missed out. Like, if you had an Electrocute or press the attack on Renekton, like, there's the sure. potential then that... It felt didn't nice need to have the yeah. It felt nice to have the ignite to finish them off, but in reality, if you had electrocute the way you comboed, like you probably would have killed them anyways. Mm -hmm. So and you would like, have done that on cooldown every like forty seconds or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Versus you have to wait for ignite to come back up. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. Maybe maybe it's a really good a uh, good thing if you are ahead. If your team is ahead, where you can control the pace. I Maybe honestly, that's a lot, lot, I lot think easier. ahead or behind it doesn't really matter as much as it is. It scales with your situational and map awareness. It mm -hmm. scales with your ability to use TP properly, and it scales with like planning and it rewards proper foresight, which is not a skill yeah. as much as it's rolling the dice cleverly. Yeah, <laughs> I think I would say. If you don't feel comfortable enough in top lane that you take TP there to help your team, then you shouldn't be taking spell look to be changing to it late. Like if you feel you can't use it well enough to just take TP straight up, then you shouldn't be taking something that like augments TP. Because the other well, part of okay. it is that it's giving you perfect lower cooldown. Perfect reminder is it it seems to me like the exact same argument that we had with like Klepto. Because, like, you're getting an early game, or, like, you're giving up an early game advantage. It wasn't a combat deal to take it early. And you're trying to build a gold lead to kind of, like, carry you late. And you did that on champions that either could proc it reliably or already had an early game advantage that was so big, Ezreal, that, you know, they were going to be strong kind of no matter what Keystone they mm -hmm, took, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, it feels a lot the same, but to be effective, it seems harder. Yeah, and like Klepto, the last question I think we had was about the Klepto nerf. I uh, I think we can just roundtable this real quick. I was gonna skip it, but we can. Uh, talk about it since you mentioned it, I I think the Klepto nerf. I didn't think Klepto was that bad to begin with. I didn't think it was so dominant. I think it was dominant in that it reinforced to people that a lot of shit happened. Like, oh my god, look at all the shit in my inventory. This rune is awesome. Yay! Right? But those <laughs> yeah. individual things really weren't that good. But it, it had like a high feedback, so it felt really good. Mm -hmm. Right? And I don't think it actually was as impactful as it felt, except on abuse cases, I think it was. Yeah, right? like Gangplank and Ezreal. Okay. I think Gangplank and Ezreal are the two that you can point to that maybe it needed some changes for, but besides that, it really wasn't that bad. And now they've nerfed Ezreal twice, so it's like, it's going to feel pretty bad for Ezreal right now, I feel like. Yeah, I think I think they're trying to rework it, because it was funny, because I was reading a dev blog, and the initial intent of Klepto was so support could stall out and find income when they can't, like, when they're losing lane. And I was like, well, that's not how it's being used one bit. <laughs> yeah, like oh. zero is that how it's working. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we could, I think they're working on a rework for Klepto, but I guess they just nerfed it in the time being. Kind of like a Poppy or Olaf thing where they just nerf it to the ground until they figure out how to do it. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's dead. I think you can still take it on I any of those champions. Could, I think you could take it, but I think you can only justify taking it on abuse case champions anyway. And yeah. even then, I think it's like those champions have taken a beating because of it, and it's taken a beating. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, you see number reductions like that, and you don't think, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like I. You know, I don't know how to answer that so much. Is it's just it seems like it would be a problem. Yeah, it so. just it annoys me that they go to nerf this and then they nerf Ezreal again. I love playing Ezreal. He's one of my favorite champions, and to see him nerfed two patches already this year and a nerf to his most prominent Keystone, it's just uh, it's looking pretty bad for him. Yeah, he's well, pretty much the only ADK I can play. Was weird. 
I didn't, yeah. That's a weird one to pick. It was an unwarranted. It's like the nerfs to uh, Orin. They just, like, they nerf the part of it that isn't really the problem. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, uh, sorry we didn't get to all the questions. We'll probably take them maybe, like, next week or uh, figure something out to to do with those those uh, questions. But anyway, that is patch 8.2. A few announcements. One, there is a LOL tournament happening. Uh, don't remember the date. February, like, tw- like the last 25th. Weekend? 25th. February 25th. Sign up. Link is will be in the episode description. Second thing, um, we are looking for another host to bring onto the podcast. Uh, someone that basically does my stuff. So not like a co-host, uh, but basically can help plan and organize things behind the scene, and then actually facilitate conversation and like ask questions and try to do things that I do kind of poorly, but uh, better, hopefully. So if you are interested, uh, send uh, send us an email. Email will be in the episode description. And basically what I'm looking for is a five-minute audio clip, no more than five minutes, of saying uh, how you got into League, uh, why, why you want to be part of the Lola podcast, and why you think you'd be good fit for the crew. So... Um, yeah, we are hoping to find someone cool to bring on to the podcast and uh, help me especially uh, get things going and continue with the community and stuff like that. So uh, did I have another announcement? Do we have anything else? Mm-hmm. I think we're good. Besides that, don't forget to join us for community games every Wednesday night. They've been popping. They've been really good. We've pretty much had like two games like going at once a lot 20 people like every yeah. time it's been nuts oh i yeah. will say that if you are interested in shout casting whether it's color or play by play uh let us know because we can use that you don't have to be good uh just hopefully better than us which is a low bar and uh <laughs> that will also help us so we can play with our community instead of just yelling at them for all the mistakes and amazing plays that they make because uh yeah uh, Alec is sick of casting for three hours straight someday. <laughs> <laughs> it does get to be a lot. <laughs> yeah. A yeah. So, and we want to play with the, the reason why we started community games is not only for the community to play together, but so we can play with the community as well. I know sometimes it's kind of weird to think that you guys are like, oh my gosh, these guys are podcasters. Holy crap. But uh, I, I guess that happens. And we want to play yeah. with you guys and then show you that we are nothing special. We're just and idiots. We, we are just us. idiots that uh, have loud voices or something. Something like that. I don't know Good. what he's talking about. Yeah, Blake is the shit. I've That's what he's trying to say. The soft spoken non idiot of the podcast. <laughs> That's been my role. Yeah. Man, my whisper voice is awkward. It is really awkward. I don't think I've ever whispered before. My vocal cords are not used to that shit. <laughs> well, my vocal cords hurt from whispering. Untrained untrained muscle. All right. So that is it for episode 176 of the little podcast. Do you know, uh, do you know, know how this. hard it is to be a lawyer without a whisper voice, Sam? Do you have any idea how hard that is? Sounds very easy. I know. Unless you're, you're doing something court. under the table. You're in court and you're like, this is really bad. This is, is this true? <laughs> God, I hope this isn't true, because it makes you look you really that fucking up. guilty. <laughs> like, is that what you say to your clients, right? <laughs> in court? I write it down. Now, this makes I, you look guilty. This is what. Yes, I've written that on like a notepad and like slid it to the person. Like, what is the counterpoint to this? Because this looks fucking terrible. I've written that verbatim and like <laughs> calmly slid a notepad over with but like. That's a paper trail, Blake. You better have an. Well, I, okay. <laughs> like, you want to look at my notes? Good luck. You know, I, let's see your warrant. You know. Anyway, but yeah, no, that's totally happened. And Alec, you're muted. Just so you know. Uh oh. There that? you go. Yeah, there you go. But means, uh, oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, pretty rough whenever you're <laughs> a uh, a lawyer with no in like no inside voice. It sucks. Yeah. I, I I think uh, whatever. You're it's fine. good for the it's good for the jury convincing though they eat that shit up, and I have what? never misunderstood. The, the whispering? No, no, the talking in like a normal deep, booming baritone. 
They're like, do you, do you <laughs> start off with your jury like, did you know that I do a podcast? <laughs> no. No, because I don't. Of credibility. Uh, you should see, go into court. I live wearing, in like, like rural blue. Missouri. No. And I'll be like, do you jurors find it offensive that I come in with deer blood on my hands that I just shot and skinned outside? Does that make any of you uncomfortable? And they'd be like, hell no, I just did the same thing, got a deer in my truck. Like, can you go to one of your court cases with a blazer, like suit pants, blazer, and then a Lola podcast t-shirt underneath? No, I couldn't do that. No? No. No, I'll, you tell you, cases. I'll tell you a story. The uh, the fashion police are super strong in my county, right? So the judges, and I don't know why they've done this. Cause I mean, are, you, are, you, are you required to wear overalls in court? No, no, you're required to <laughs> wear like, like, okay. I think it's just like a church mentality is what it is. But like, they want you in your Sunday best kind of deal. So yeah, they yeah, set attire you. requirements that people just don't meet at all, right? Like, no shorts. Can't wear shorts into court. Like, it is 98 degrees in Missouri in the summer. Wait, are you wearing a suit coat, tie, and shorts, Blake? I No, I don't wear, <laughs> I don't wear shorts. I don't have suit shorts. If I had them, I would totally wear them. <laughs> if, 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 if Lola wants to, like, the Lola wants to do a funding drive for me to get suit shorts, I will totally accept it. <laughs> I have but. a really easy way for you to do this. You take some of your suit pants and you cut no, them at the knee. <laughs> you know how hard it is to get suit pants that match your coat? Like, you have to buy those in a set. They don't usually sell them <laughs> Molly Wampus like that. But they make Just... Docker shorts. They're ugly, but they make them. <laughs> you know. I think that's the least of your worry looking at ugly shorts with your suit I well i mean <laughs> i don't know how you put socks on with that because you still got to wear like some kind of dress shoes and then the socks are going to look weird but regardless they have this dress code you like no shorts no jeans that have any kind of a hole in them at all and it's hard to buy jeans anymore as an average human being without it having like some kind of fashionable rip or hole Right. I I haven't owned one since like middle school, man. I don't no, know. I'm, which, I'm just saying. What like, you're having? If you, go to, <laughs> you go to <laughs> any kind of like Gap or something. You either you, like I suppose you could buy normal jeans, but people don't do that. There's always something like you can have your ass bedazzled as shit, but if you have a slit in your jeans, like nope, you know, forget <laughs> about it. And what they do, and this is fucking great, is what they do is there's a rack of old abandoned clothes. So oh. if you don't meet the dress code requirement, they will eat, Oh, by the way, no open-toed shoes. So if you wear flip-flops in the summer or, like, ladies' dress shoes that have, like, an open toe at the end, nope. Get the hell out of my courthouse, right? Dang. But they have, like, a rack of clothes over there that's, like, all shapes and sizes of, like, abandoned clothes that – Although hideous and looks like you got dressed and lost and found, because that's exactly what you did, is that, uh, you know, none of it matches. It looks terrible, but it all meets the dress code, right? So you get people looking like like uh, homeless Mary Poppins <laughs> show up, and I'm like, ah, you didn't meet the dress code, did you? I'm Mary Poppins, bitch. Or, like, the other option is... They have a total convict outfit that's like a full body orange jumpsuit that you can you can't <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be great in. for your case. And I'm like, you're coming to a divorce court in an orange jumpsuit. I mean, it's funny. <laughs> we all know what happened, but it's like mm, make yourself look guilty a yeah, little you bit. Look, you look fucking <laughs> terrible. Like she's gonna come in and say you're a violent person or something, and you're wearing that. Like I don't believe it. Uh oh. Mm-hmm. You know, but I mean, that happens. Like, it's it's funny because those are like some of the only clothes and I've had people like, you know, or like I had one guy who he had, a, he had a hat and they don't let you wear a hat. And the hat was like, for some reason, I have no idea how this story works, but he really needed the hat because the hat had something on it or something in it or whatever, that it was part of his story was he needed to show you his hat to say, <laughs> this is the hat I had on, and you can't see blah, 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 and this hat. See, the bullet right? hole went through here. <laughs> well, I mean, it was that kind of a deal. I don't know. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember how it factored in, but it did factor in. And he sat and he argued with the bailiff that he had to have his hat so long that the bailiff 
ordered him out of the courtroom. He refused to leave, and he was arrested on the spot and never brought to court. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. And spent, like, a twenty next 24 hours in hold for contempt of court because he refused to take off his hat. <laughs> All right. With that story, yeah. I think we can finally close out this episode. That is it for episode 176 of the Lola Podcast. We will see you guys next week. See you later. <laughs> Good night, everybody!